Welcome to the NRT Now podcast, giving you the latest in Christian music news, topics, and artist interviews directly from the largest Christian music site online, newreleasetoday.com. Now, here's your host, Jake. Hey guys, welcome to episode 32, and we're going to get right into it today. I have Ryan Williams with River Valley Worship. Hey, thanks for joining us, man. Jake, thanks so much for having me, man. It's great to be here. So tell us a little bit about River Valley. I understand you guys are up in Minnesota. Minneapolis, Minnesota, the great white north. And the land of a thousand lakes. (laughs) That too. Yeah, the church is uh, 25 years old this year. And so we've got to see a lot of crazy, amazing things, a lot of failure, a lot of success. God's done some really amazing things in that community there. It's a church about 12,000 people, multiple campuses, campuses in lots of different types of settings, urban, downtown suburbs. So we get to uh, be a part and see quite a bit here in Minneapolis. How many campuses do you guys have across Minneapolis? We have nine at this point. Yep. And they're all kind of spread out all across the Twin Cities. Awesome. Tell us a little bit about kind of what the heart and what the planting of each one of those locations are and just how the worship filters down through all of those locations. Yeah, absolutely. So like any other church that's trying to make a difference and trying to reach people for Christ, we have values that guide what we do and help us make decisions. And our number one value as a church is the presence of God. I think it's a fair assumption to say that the worship ministry of a church, you know, has a, a little bit to do with that value, but we don't definitely don't carry that value of our church exclusively. The, the presence of God can be translated and carried through lots of different ways, but we definitely do take the responsibility and feel the weight of being a worship ministry in a church that has declared our our number one value is the presence of God. And so if you were to come hang out at a, at a weekend service with us, uh, hopefully you'd see that it's engaging that uh, even though we're in a predominantly Norwegian Scandinavian culture where they're a little bit more prone to be stoic with their response, outward response in worship, uh, we're blessed to be in a place where people are alive and they're passionate Definitely not a performance type thing. People sing loud, they engage. And so it's really fun to be a part of a community like that. So one of the biggest things that's going on right now, and I think what a lot of people are wondering right now is how are churches handling this distancing, not being able to meet together, the church online? You know, so many things have changed about how we worship and how we roll. What have you guys seen up there at River Valley? Yeah, one of the, I guess, the success stories that we've had is we've always done the live stream uh, medium where we've always made services available online to people who could be in the room. But just like everybody else, when this this current situation kind of broke down and uh, changed the way, changed our ability to gather, the whole church rallied. All of a sudden, teams were created and committees were created to improve and focus on our online experience. And one of the greatest stories we've had out of these last few weeks is just like everyone else, we had to have our Good Friday service online, you know? So we film film these services ahead of time. That's the way we've done them in a film studio at one of our buildings. We uh, pre, pre-recorded the Good Friday service a couple of days before, and then it played that Friday night. And the overwhelming amount of feedback we got from people who said, I hope we never do Good Friday like we used to ever again. The, wow. the sacred, precious moments, I mean, a countless, that parents were being able to take communion with their children in their living room. Little children were getting, literally accepting Christ into their heart in their living room at home during these Good Friday services. And that's just a little bit of a hint, just a, a trace of what God can do in circumstances that we see as abnormal or not quite comfortable or not what we would prefer. And so our pastor said, it: we'll never do Good Friday another way. We're going to always have Good Friday online from now on. So I thought that was kind of cool. Awesome. Well, I guess that answers one of my questions of what's going to pass through from this quarantine into your day-to-day life. So I guess, yeah, thank you for leading that one. Thank, thanks for taking away yeah. my thunder on that one. <laughs> Um, what have you seen from the worship side, just how people are connecting with the worship? There's a certain atmosphere when you're able to come in as a group of people and to worship together. 
and just the atmosphere of worship. What are you seeing that translation to the at home and what changes and what challenges have you seen there? I remember talking to one of the teams you know, we have multiple locations. So we've been kind of rotating our worship leaders and worship teams through the pre-recorded worship times for the weekend. And I was talking to one of the teams that was leading that week. And I, and uh, me and one of our production guys who, who had been the main like mix engineer for the weekend, he had noticed like, you know, when you're in a room all together and it's, you know, a big crowd of people and you're standing on the stage as a worship leader, you know, you're doing a few things all at once. You're gauging the room. You're paying attention to how people are engaging. If they're engaging, are they singing? You can catch what's happening with that family on the, the left side, or you can see what's happening with that teenager on the second row. And hopefully, you know, with wisdom and with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you're making changes. Maybe you're able to flex a little bit here and there to help serve people. And with these pre-recorded online services for us, none of that is at play. It's almost like we realized that as worship teams and as worship pastors and worship leaders, I was telling them, you pretty much have to just let go as if no one's ever going to see this recording ever because people are staring at you through a screen, through a box. There is no in-person atmosphere like you'd mentioned. It feels counterintuitive, but I got to act like no one's ever going to see this worship recording and I think that authenticity will translate through what could be seen as a barrier, which could be a phone or a computer screen. Uh, we realized that we had to make that shift, that mindset shift. And so how do you see that playing out once we are able to gather, just learning that lesson of worship like nobody's going to see this. And then once we get back together, obviously everybody's going to see it again. You, you can see people staring back. How do you think that's going to translate down the road? I just think that it reminds us of the principle of authenticity. It wouldn't be right for me to say it's the secret sauce or it's the magic potion when it comes to worship leading, but it is so vital to what we do. Nobody's interested in professional Christianity. Nobody's interested in a show or put on a mask and playing a part. People want and they subcon even subconsciously they respond to auth authenticity. Authentic worship is no different. And I think what, what can be carried over when things kind of go back to normal, if we can say that, is wave that flag of authenticity. You can't beat it. So I stalked your Instagram just a little bit. You know, I, I was able to go back like years worth because you Instagram like <laughs> I do. <laughs> One post every few months. Right up, man. It. Right up. <laughs> um, but you're talking about releasing both sides you know, and releasing it into this current climate back in at the end yeah. of March there. Talk about, you know, that song as we start leading into talking about your new album. Uh, talk about releasing that song and what that song is and in this present time. Yeah, Both Sides is, uh, it was written very specifically for our Easter services last year. So we tried to be very precise with telling the story of Easter and again, trying to kind of trying to bring a fresh perspective to a, a very foundational truth. But the other layer down of what that song is about, it's a song about authority. And Jesus proved to us, you know, as we read through the uh, John 11, in chapter 11, where it tells the story of Lazarus. That's the first instance that we have where Jesus had a face-to-face -face encounter with a tomb. He stood on one side, called his friend back to life. A lot of scholars say that was the catalytic moment that started Jesus's march to the cross is when he raised Lazarus from the dead. The Pharisees were like, okay, we've had enough. We can't let this guy do anything else. It's time to take him out. And a lot of commentaries believe that it was weeks later where Jesus died on the cross, was put in the grave. And there he is, that second instance of a face-to-face -face encounter with the tomb. But there it's himself on the other side of the tomb. And the whole world watched. Does he have authority on that side of the tomb as well? And obviously he proved his point in such a miraculous way. For that song, both sides, we knew it was going to be great for Easter, but for it to be released in this day and age, it was such a punch in the face to darkness, reminding us who has the ultimate authority. That's awesome. So I've been listening to this album since Friday. Um, it released when we're recording this just a few days ago. 
Yeah, totally. The real thing is one of the songs that really has st- uh, stood out to me, mainly yeah. as a guitar player, because <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, those lines, oh my gosh, just That's so they're cool. so well for me. They're relatively easy to play. I still haven't figured yeah, out yeah. some of it, but just the simplicity, but just how much it fills the song. Yeah, um, but just the message of it as well. That's the one that's really stuck out to me so far. Um, talk so about cool. a little bit about the process of this album and kind of what has been going on through your church that led to writing of these songs. Yeah, we started writing for this project. It would have been about a year and a half ago now. And uh, you brought up Real Thing. Real Thing was actually the first song that came out. That song, coincidentally, does really hint at kind of the theme and the the thread that runs through the whole project. We didn't have the theme yet, Alters. We didn't have that theme uh, when we wrote Real Thing, but little did we know that that was kind of foreshadowing what the whole album was going to be about. And for us, we believe that when we do these projects, it's costly, you know, it's costly on many levels and it should cost you something. If it's worth doing, if it's uh, something you're really called to, if it's, a believer stepping up and beating, being obedient to the call upon their life, it's going to cost you something. And there's a line in the song that says, uh, I could never live a life that cost me nothing. For us, that's just such a great intersection of, again, the values of our church. Some of the biggest things that we care about as a church, like I mentioned before, is the presence of God, worship, and then a, a heart for the world. We call it global project. Lack of a better term, it's missions. And that song is a, it's like a time capsule for us of where this great intersection happens between worship and missions. Uh, you're stirred, you get a re- revelation, you get a glimpse of who God is, and it stirs you and compels you to live a life that is costly so that you can reach the world. I was saying to somebody the other day, it's st- the whole songwriting process started with pr- a prayer meeting without hyping it up or uh, feeling the need to be hyper-spiritual. That prayer meeting was deeply moving. It really set the tone for this whole project. And it reminded us that we don't have to carry the burden of outcome when it comes to these projects. How far are these songs going to go? Who's going to hear these songs? How much is it going to sell? Who's so-and-so going to think about this? Blah, blah, blah. But really, we have to only carry the burden of obedience. God's called us to do this. And that's the burden that we carry. We talked about both sides a little bit just a second ago. What is one of the songs on this album that... When you entered the process, it was kind of tugging, but just had a bigger impact than what you were expecting at the time. Mm. Yeah, I can answer that question a few different ways. I think every song probably has a certain type of pivotal moment about how it was written or when it came to be or how it got finished. But to answer your question about maybe something that wasn't really on our radar or felt or felt unexpected. I think the last song, the album is called sounds like grace. And, uh, that's the only song that is not a co-write. We're very collaborative. We have a really great team with a lot of great talented people. And that song sounds like grace was really just like my own little prayer type song. I think writing congregational worship songs is really hard to do. It's really hard to do on your own. So that's why I like doing it with a bunch of people. But that song was really supposed to just be my little theme song for my year. It was just a prayer from me to God. And I kind of accidentally was playing it on one of our writing trips. And I didn't think anybody was around. Little did I know there was about three or four people around the corner who heard me playing it, just working it out. Again, it was very unexpected, the response that I got even that in that writing room. And they pretty much said, we're going to beat you up unless you finish this song. At least let us record the demo and see how it turns out. The rest is history. That song has been really, really special for a lot of people already. And that's a very humbling thing. Nothing says good Christian collaboration like the threat of violence. <laughs> I will beat you up yeah. right now in Jesus' name. Yeah. Uh, I will beat you to a pulp and pray for your recovery. <laughs> on- <laughs> that's right. Sounds about right. So you're talking about being collaborative. I noticed that Andrew Holt is one of the people that you guys yeah. collaborated with. And we had him on a few episodes ago. And obviously, you know, he's with a different church. I don't necessarily want to say competition, but yeah, yeah, yeah. They're putting out their own stuff over there as well. Talk about that little bit of collaboration because it seems like there's so much just in churches, even within a city, 
And now you're talking about making music, selling albums and all that kind of stuff. There always seems to be a little bit of competition when mm. that environment uh, within sure. churches and stuff. So talk about that collaboration with Andrew Holt and working between the two churches there. The collaboration with Andrew, again, and again, just to mention the blogging codes doing amazing things. You know, when we've, we've been in town there in Nashville to do some random projects, we went to church there and we're just totally blessed by what they're doing. And uh, Henry and Alex are the way that they're leading the, the mentality and the, the mindset we as believers and creatives in the church, we should just be disarming with the way that we think about each other, each other's talent and gift. And so the collaboration with Andrew, that was a real easy, simple one where, you know, we did take a few trips every year to Nashville to catch different people and write with them. And, and some of the guys from our team got paired up with Andrew just through, I think through our label or something and had a great, I mean, they had a great time and wrote that, started that song, which is called Fresh Chance. The start of that song came in that Nashville session and then months down the road got tweaked and edited to get it finished and get to the finish line and get it on the album. The bulk of the work for the album is on the West Coast with our producer, uh, Mike Fatkin, and he's a foundational member of Hillsong Church and Young and Free. So we're really used to this idea of family of God and being able to find really common ground and kind of a common energy to go after a goal of, hey, this is what we want to do as a church. And so we found it pretty effortless to be able to link arms with other people from other parts of the country and different movements and chase after a great song and hopefully serve people. I'll take this down to a little bit more personal level. Through this quarantine, we've been all stuck at our houses. What's been really working through your heart through this whole process? The quarantine has been interesting, hasn't it? Because, I mean, I could try to think of it now through my my short amount of 30 something years on this planet. You know, where everybody on planet Earth is in the same boat. I mean, that's why this feels like a, such a stark moment in history because it's unlike anything we've ever experienced before. Usually when you're going through a hard time like this, you're not doing it with 7 billion other of your closest friends. You know, this is a global thing that's happened where it's affecting every single beating heart on the planet. It's reminded me life at its biggest is still so fragile and still so thin and our planning and our strategies and our infrastructure that we've set up as wise and as smart as we are as mankind. It's all so frail and fragile. It goes back to that idea of that nursery rhyme type idea. He's got the whole world in his hands. It goes back to that song, both sides. Who's the ultimate authority in this life? Jesus is. And so I think a lot about, not in a morbid way, but I think a lot about like when I'm on my deathbed, what are the things I'm going to be caring about the most? And man, this quarantine has whipped us into shape or should have real quick that the things that matter in this life are really what's in front of us, what's around us, what God has placed in the form of people, family, friends. Those are the things that matter. Not our work situation, not our paycheck, not our, all of our leisure entertainment activities that we've been cut off from. It's been a great reminder. And I think the biggest tragedy from this is if things go back to normal and we've not changed at all, that would be the biggest loss that we've experienced as the family of humanity. And it's crazy that you say that because that's exactly what started coming out in my thought process lately is just how mind boggling it is that everybody in the world is going through the same season at the same time. Yes. And we're used to individually carrying each other th- yeah. or to go into our seasons by ourselves, but now everybody's in the same season together. And it's, yes. it's kind of weird that we're not carrying each other through our own seasons. I mean, we all have different aspects to it. Some people are handling it better than others or have different struggles through the process, but everybody's going through the same season and it's just yep. weird that we're not carrying each other through different seasons. We're all walking through that same thing ourselves. A hundred percent. That's why it's just, it, it's so unique. You know, it's been day, I don't know, day 60, day 50, something, something like that. And I still, I wake up every day shaking my head a little bit. Like, I can't believe that this is, this is real. Yeah, It just seems like a dream. Yeah, it does. You're just waiting every day for what's the latest news. When do we yep. finally get to escape lockdown? Yep. And when do we 
get to pretend like we're normal again. And yes, you know, it's just kind of that search every day for it. Yeah. Totally right. And then of course we have all the politics involved and all the other fun stuff yeah. that it just, doesn't really help. No, <laughs> it drives you bananas. <laughs> yeah, it but does. That division where everybody's yelling from two different sides, it seems like. Without being weird about it, just I have to limit the amount of articles that I read and news segments that I take in. You know, there's a lot about this that we don't know. I think there are, there's some data, there are some stats that we have that it could be helpful. But I started to realize CNN, USA Today, these supposedly proven sources of truth, so many of their articles are about like, this may happen, this could happen, yeah. not this will happen, or here's the data, we're guaranteed that this is going to take place. No, this is all just speculation just to fill the air. And I think when you're living in a crisis like this, I don't think speculation is really your friend. So I've really had to cut down on that quite a bit. And I'm with you there. And it's a really fine line. And I think we can take this faith base too, but it's a yeah. very fine line of being informed and being yep. educated, being knowledgeable of what's actually going on and not just reading the headlines or the sensationalism, but also at the same exactly point, right. not diving headfirst into that rabbit hole that you get yourself lost in as well, which exactly I'm, right. I'm very guilty of as well. From a faith based perspective, I think that's valid as well. You know, instead yeah. of reacting to the kind of the surface level, or you know, you can go both sides. You can react at that surface level, or yeah. you can just dive so deep into theology and yeah, just the semantics of the Bible and all that that you kind of lose that side of it as well. Yeah, it's brilliant. That's right. I guess I'll end this here with what are you looking forward to most as we get out of quarantine? What both you yeah. know from a church standpoint and just Ryan, what does Ryan want to do? What's What have you been missing yeah, yeah. the most? Yeah, I mean, those are pretty easy answers. Maybe that shows how much I've been thinking about it. I don't know. I'm guilty. It's not a like a fake answer. I really am looking forward to getting back and just being in church with people. I've been a guy that's been in church my whole life since I was a little kid. And what a treasure for me to realize that something that I've experienced my whole life has been taken away from me for a little bit. As far as the gathering together of believers, you know, church is never closed. But that gathering has definitely been limited. I'm anxious in the best way to get back and just be with people and be in church. And I, I think on a personal level, I I love to travel, you know, for fun. And so I didn't have like five vacations or anything that were canceled during this time already. I'm not saying that. But I love to travel and I can't wait for that, for that feeling of being able to know I can get on a plane and go somewhere. That's awesome. So, well, we very much appreciate you hanging out with us for a while. And like I said, if you haven't listened to the album, please do. It's amazing. And yeah, uh, we hope a speedy end of the quarantine for us all. I'm with you. Thanks for having me so much. Appreciate it. <laughs>